reading this morning from the 14th of Luke, beginning in verse 7. It says, Now Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We ask, Father, that you would uh, be our teacher and open this passage of Scripture today. Um, Lord, may we not just understand what it is saying, but may we apply it as you see fit to apply it to our lives individually. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor was uh, standing at the door one day greeting people as they left, and one faithful uh, parishioner came up and said, uh, "said doesn't it doesn't it make you nervous to be preaching on sin every week with all those experts sitting out there in the congregation?" Now I don't know what that pastor answered, the account didn't say. All I know is the right answer should have been, no, it doesn't make me nervous because I know that the worst sinner is standing in the pulpit. Because the truth is, we're all in the same boat, are we not? The truth is that if you knew what I know about me, I don't know if you'd be back next week. But then again, if I knew what you know about you, I don't know if I'd want you back <laughs> next week. We all have a life that is somewhat short of the glory of God, do we not? It's important that we see ourselves as God sees us, you see, because this, that drives the humility that leads to heaven and that leads to holy living. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud, let that sink in for a moment this morning. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So it's important to be humble, not the ah shucks, it was nothing kind of humility. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. But this is a humility that sees God for who God is and that sees me for who I really am. It's the kind of humility that we see identified in Scripture in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, when Isaiah, this very gracious, godly, educated, uh, brilliant, court-educated man, when he saw God high and lifted up, you recall his reaction. His reaction was, oh, I am a man of unclean lips. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And you may recall what God's reaction is. Oh, Isaiah, don't worry about it. You're really not so bad. In fact, you're the best one around here. Is that God's reaction? Not at all. God sent an angel with a burning coal to touch his lips and to say to him, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The issue wasn't whether Isaiah was a sinner or not. The issue was whether he was repentant or not, and then whether the sin was forgiven or not. And a gracious God saw fit to forgive him based on his humility and his willingness to see himself as God see him. See, we don't really ever see ourselves correctly until we see ourselves as God is, until we see ourselves in the light of our Heavenly Father. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the Pharisees here. The Pharisees are seeing themselves as they see themselves. They're judging by their own standards. And you recall the setting in this passage of Scripture, how Jesus has been invited and gone to lunch to one of his opposition Pharisees on this particular day. But it's a setup. 
They've placed before him a man who was disabled in the hopes that Jesus would heal him so that they could accuse Jesus of violating their Sabbath standards, not God's, but theirs, the ones they had built up around God's standards. You recall how Jesus thwarted their effort by asking a couple questions that just highlighted the hypocrisy that was part of their own lives, their willingness to do whatever work was required to save their livestock or to save their family, and yet this man they had no time for or heart for or compassion for, and so they were left with no response. But Jesus isn't done. And so we come to verse seven where he says, now he told a parable to those who were invited. If they have no further response, he does. And he tells this parable. Now, many teach that this parable is a parable that's teaching us not to put ourselves forward not to try and advance ourselves. Kind of a commentary on a verse like Proverbs 27, 2, where the Lord says, let another praise you and not you yourself. Well, that's great advice, and that is part of what this passage is teaching by way of, by way of application, but it's not the main point of the passage. It's not the main point of this passage. This is a parable. And if you remember, we've seen before, parables are Jesus using physical realities, physical truths, things that are everyday examples of people, things that people knew in order to teach a deeper spiritual truth. And that's what he is doing here. The heart of this passage that begins in verse 1 and extends down at least through verse 24 is in verse 11, where Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled And he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a principle that if you've been with us as we've been going through Luke, we have seen before. Jesus kind of hammers home this point relentlessly as he goes through his ministry here on earth because the main reason that people are not saved is because they will not humble themselves before the righteous God and acknowledge their sin. That's why this phraseology is so critical not just in this passage, but in others as well. This is a warning, another way that Jesus hits the same point, a warning against the danger of self-justification and self-promotion that plagues all of us, not just some of us. The Pharisees are certainly prime examples. That's why they are constantly Jesus' Uh, protagonists in the Gospels because they were promoting themselves. They considered themselves better than others. So they were desperately in need of this message. They saw themselves as they saw themselves, not as God saw them. But see, we are all Pharisees at heart. We're all Pharisees at heart. It's the way we're born. And so there has to be something that helps us Deal with that. And Jesus is teaching here that for entrance into God's kingdom, something has to change. So he gives us the simple parable that we want to look at first so we understand what is it he's actually teaching. And then we want to see the spiritual point that he's trying to make so that we see that it goes deeper than just a lesson in, against pride. So the simple parable parable. Verse 7 tells us what drove this parable. Jesus had seen something when he first arrived. He says, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. Jesus' audience here is those who have been invited. Remember, he's at the, at the, at the lunch at the Pharisee's house. So the, those who are invited is those other ones who were there at the party. But as they came in, Jesus had been there early enough to see some of them arriving And he saw that they were scrambling for the most honored seats. And in that, he saw the human tendency to push oneself forward, which he knew was absolutely devastating to the possibility of salvation. And so he wants to use this and address this because in it he sees the the, the human nature in need of transformation and that's what he wants to address. So what is the human tendency? Let's look at that first, the human tendency. In those days... 
We have to understand, they didn't sit to eat at a banquet like we would, right? We go to the banquet, we sit in our seat, and we eat the food, and it seems like the best way. But in those, in those days, they didn't do it that way. At a formal banquet, they reclined on couches. In some ways, that sounds comfortable, but when I think about inclining, reclining like this and trying to eat like that, it, it doesn't do much for me. But that's the way they did it. And so at a formal banquet like this, there would be uh, a very definite kind of pecking order in the seating arrangement. The host couch would be at the head of the table, and there the host would sit in the middle. On his left would be the second person who was most honored, and then on his right, the next one. The couch on the left of the table would have room for three more people that were invited, and they would be numbers, essentially numbers four through six, beginning in the middle to the left and then to the right. On the right-hand side of the host couch would be another one that seated three more people. Numbers, whatever is left, numbers seven through nine. And at the foot of the table would be numbers 10 through 12. So the seating order de de determined one's, it's kind of a pecking order, if you will. And if the feast was large enough, there would be other tables separated into other places and there would be this same pecking order going on there. So this is the arrangement as Jesus walks into this banquet. And human nature takes over as people come. They chose, as they arrived, the places of honor. They didn't have place cards in those days, right? You go to a banquet today and it'll, they'll tell you where to sit. If you're, if you're forward enough like me, you change the place card around to wherever you want it, right? But, 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 but the intention is that you wouldn't do that and that you'd be seating where, seated where they put you. But they didn't have those in those days. In the mind of the host, there would be a, an order of seating, but because somebody might arrive early, he might not be around, as they, arrived, they would try and get the place of honor. And so they would come and they would look around and see where they could get seated as high as they dared, assuming kind of that, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and if you got the seat, probably nobody will come along and move you out of it. Guy might realizes as he walks in, he could never hope to attain number two position. But number four looks pretty good, and so he kind of slides in there ahead of whoever else may be trying to get that, hoping that he will not be moved. Everybody is seeking to be as near the host as possible or to be as near someone else as possible that might be able to do them some good. This is kind of the first century uh, equivalent of ladder climbing, Right? Everyone hoped to find a favored place. Now, you can imagine that in that environment, humility would have been considered a great weakness, <laughs> would not have been considered a strength. In fact, humility was basically a virtue that was unknown in the ancient world. The whole idea was to push yourself forward. And so as Jesus sees this infighting that's going on, it suggests to him a parable. Jesus addresses this inclination for self-promotion by saying in verses 5 through 8, when you were invited by someone to a wedding feast. Now, he's not at a wedding feast, keep in mind. He's just at a banquet. So he's perhaps using the term wedding feast just in, out of sensitivity to not look like he's picking on what happened earlier at that particular one. I think there's another reason that he uses wedding feast, which we'll see in a little bit. But at any rate, that's the example he uses. But the whole idea would have been similar. He says, when you're invited by, to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, your host, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give this place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. What's Jesus doing here? Well, he's addressing the natural, the natural inclination we all have to, to be important, right? We want to think that we matter. And so one way to try and emphasize that is to try and look for opportunities to put ourselves forward. I love the story that came out of the election in 1952. I was around, but I was young. I read about it later, okay? And Adlai Stevenson was running against... What, who became President Eisenhower at the time. And Stevenson was, was known, he was the governor of Illinois at the time, but he was known for his brilliance. He was considered a very educated uh, 
kind of elite kind of person, which in some circles worked to his advantage, but it was considered that in most circles it worked to his disadvantage. It was considered that the average person wouldn't probably even understand him, let alone, let alone uh, want to vote for him. So Stevenson decided to try this out. He's taken a cab to the airport after a speaking engagement one day. And he said to the cabbie, as he's riding to the airport, he said, you know, maybe you can help me out here. He said, some people think that I speak over the head of the average man. What do you think? And the cabbie replied, he said, well, governor, he said, I understand you all right, but I don't know about the average guy. <laughs> Obviously, Stephen is considering him an average guy, but he doesn't consider himself an average guy, and none of us would, right? We're the cabbie that knows it all. Stephen had really, Stevenson had really thought about that. He might have thought a cabbie might not be the right guy to ask that question of, right? Most of them that I've known didn't know their way around town, but they knew everything else there was to know. No offense if you're a cabbie, I hope, uh, today. But we all want to exaggerate our importance. We don't want to be average. Nobody wants to be average. Sometimes we get very clever about that. Any of you remember Sam Irvin? Sam Irvin was the senator from North Carolina that headed the Watergate investigating committee. He, he looked like, if you remember him on TV, he just looked like an old country lawyer. I talked like an old country lawyer. But I remember reading one time Howard Baker, who was the ranking Republican member of that committee, said this one time. He said, when Sam reaches the point where he refers to himself, as just a poor old country lawyer from North Carolina, I'm motivated to do two things. First, out of reflex action, I put my hand on my wallet. Good move, right? And then I gently remind him that while he may consider himself to be just a poor old country lawyer, he is also an honor graduate of Harvard Law School. He said, that's when the chairman Sam raises his magnificent eyebrows, cocks his head, beams his benign smile, and whispers, Yes, Howard, but nobody can tell it. That was his whole goal in life, right? To represent himself as something that he wasn't. Someone that would be considered lower, but the whole goal was to actually seek a place of honor. See, Jesus knows all the tricks. Jesus knows all the ways that we like to put ourselves forward. And what he's, what he's getting at here is when we, when we self-promote, we become vulnerable, we self-promote. We're not understanding ourselves in light of who God is and who we are. And so he's speaking against this natural tendency. This is who we are by nature. And so this will be something that has to change if we're going to have the relationship with God that we want. So there needs to be, secondly then, a humbling transformation to this human tendency. And Jesus addresses that in verse 10. He says, but when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest places so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. In other words, it won't just be you and the host. Everybody will see this. Let that happen. Try a little humility. Now, again, we have to realize that you, know, that you would have never heard this from the Greek philosophers or the intelligentsia of the day in which Jesus lived. It simply wasn't done. Humility is strictly a Christian virtue. The word humility was virtually unknown until the time of Christ. So understand, this is something different. It's not natural what Jesus is suggesting here. Jesus is saying, no, this is this something you ought to try. You might be surprised. It's a little bit interesting that Jesus would have to say this to the Pharisees who supposedly were experts at the Old Testament, right? Because even in the Old Testament, you have, you have passages like Proverbs 25, verses 6 and 7, where it says, don't put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. All Jesus is really doing is picking on a passage of the Old, of the Old Testament and using it to illustrate his point. Now notice another thing here. Jesus doesn't say, go find a lower place. What does he say? Does your Bible have the same thing mine does? He says, go find the what? The lowest place. Start at the bottom. 
Jesus' advice is and don't, don't seek the place of honor where you would like to be. Don't even seek the place of where you think you should be. Seek the lowest place of all. That's humbling, isn't it? Why would I want to do that? Somebody might think I really belong there. Somebody might think that's what somebody else really thinks of me. But Jesus is saying, no, no, that's where I want you to go. I want you to have that kind of mind in you. I, I remember a, a young man I grew up with in high school, and, and uh, Art Dagan, who was with us a few weeks ago, was the neighbor of this young boy. And he used to ask him once in a while when he was junior and senior in high school, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What do you, what's your job going to be? And he, he would reply, I don't know, but I want to start at the top. He knew he wanted to start at the top. I thought that was very you know, interesting for a kid in high school to want to do that. I wanted to get to the top, but I kind of realized you're not going to start at the top probably. You're going to have to start at the bottom. But that's the human tendency. I want to be important. I want to matter. And so I better be promoting myself to get there. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I want you to take the lowest place. I want you to show yourself to be somebody who is humble enough to do that. So that's the, that's the simple parable, okay? I think, it's, I think it's not unclear, right? It's pretty clear what Jesus is saying. But now the question is, is this just, is this just a gimmick of, you know, of reverse psychology that Jesus is using so that, so that you're kind of going about this in a way that makes, makes you look good and makes others not look so good to gain recognition? Is that what this is about? Is this just about, you know, etiquette, human etiquette? Is this about a a, a, a nice strategy to gain position. Well, I don't think so, do you? That's not really what Jesus was here on earth to do. This is, that's why this is called a parable. It's pointing us, yes, to a lifestyle of true humility, but there's a spiritual truth beyond this that we have to get to. That's where Jesus is really going. So what is the spiritual point? I think you will understand this a little better if you understand that the Bible often, and Jesus in particular, often uses a wedding feast to depict the kingdom of God. He uses a wedding feast to depict the kingdom of God. For example, and I, I could give you multiple examples from the Old Testament, one after another, but Isaiah 25, verse 6. God says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of, that doesn't sound good to me, but it was a delicacy, you gotta understand, right? Of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Wedding feasts were often used to represent the kingdom of God. And I think that's why Jesus chose wedding feast as the example here rather than just a normal banquet or some kind of other feast. It's a wedding feast. Why? Because he's pointing them toward the kingdom of God. So what's the human tendency with regard to the, to the kingdom of God? And the human tendency that we've seen time after time as we're going through this gospel is what? To get to the banquet through self-promotion. To get into the kingdom of God by extolling myself by pointing out my virtues, by insisting on my own worth, by promoting my cause, by doing good things in order that God has to take me. That's the natural tendency. This is just another way that Jesus is trying to show the Pharisees that their scramble for seating at this banquet is the same thing they're doing spiritually to try to get into the kingdom of God. They're putting themselves forward. And Jesus sees in that. He sees in that scramble for seeding that they went through. He sees that their hearts are full of themselves. This is their ticket. Their ticket to the banquet is what? Their good works. Keeping the law. At least the law as they define it. That's the way they're going to get there. And the Pharisees typically were, you know, they, they, they would look down on the common man, on the average man, while promoting their good works of, you know, making sure that they were fasting twice a week, or at least 
they gave the appearance of that. Apparently they were very clever at, at uh, putting makeup on so that it looked like they'd been fasting, whether it was true or not. They were very clever at giving tithes. They, they carefully tithed everything, even, even to, the, uh, even to the, uh, the, uh, the, the things that they grew in their garden. Everything was tithed, the cumin, and the mint. They were very careful in their tithing. They were careful to keep the Sabbath regulations as they understood them. They were bringing their sacrifices. You could be sure. They looked down on all those who couldn't keep up with them because they had, they had rules that other people didn't even know about. So when Jesus came along, what was the message? We know the message in summary form because he gives it to us right at the beginning of his ministry, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came along with a message of repentance, it was absolutely abhorrent to them. To repent would be to acknowledge I'm not good enough and their whole ticket was to be good enough. The human tendency with regard to the kingdom of God is that I must earn my own way. I must earn God's approval. I must put God under obligation to me. But that escapes the great truth of Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to see that truth, beloved. And Jesus is ringing the changes on it again. We have to see that truth or we'll never get to the cure. Why would you take a cure and you don't think you're sick? We have to see what, what Joseph Conrad saw in, when he wrote the book, you know, The Heart of Darkness. What was he teaching in that book? What was he trying to say? He was trying to say that the selfish, selfish barbarism of the human heart is the same, whether it's found in the jungles of the deepest, darkest part of the Congo or on the sophisticated streets of London. The darkness of the human heart pervades all of us. That was the message in that book. What was the message William Golding was getting across when he wrote the book, The Lord of the Flies, and he had all of these boys who were isolated on their own on an island, and suddenly they turned into, over time, they turned into degenerated, murderous savages. What's he saying? He's saying the human heart is like that. All it is is a reflection of what the Bible has said all along. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately, terminally ill. That's what the word means. We will not get to salvation until we see that. The human tendency is to self-justify. The human tendency is to say, I think I can be good enough. The human tendency is to say, surely I must do this and surely then God will accept me. But instead of that, what we need is a heavenly transformation. A heavenly transformation. This is there all the way through the Bible, even in the Old Testament. Testament, even in the Old Testament. I'm always amazed when people come along and say, well, we're saved by grace in the New Testament, but those poor guys in the Old Testament were saved by keeping the law. Listen, no one was ever saved by keeping the law, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. That's the reason that in God's great image, his great picture, his great example of salvation, what happened first First, the children of Israel were released and delivered from slavery in Egypt, right? Then the law was given. What was the point? You don't get delivered by keeping the law. The law comes afterwards. The law shows us our need of salvation then, and then the law shows us how to live once we've come to faith in Christ. But human merit was never the issue. Turn with me to Exodus 20. Let me give you, this is, this is everywhere in the Old Testament, we give you such a clear example. Exodus 20. It wasn't, it's never been a matter of human beings trying to find God. Human beings do not look for God. You say, oh, I know people that seek God. No, you know people who seek a God of their own making. There are people who do that. Seek the true God, we all run. All of us. That's why the Bible says there's no one who seeks after righteous. No, not one. And so it's good that God comes for us because we would never come for him. That's the message in Exodus 20. Look at verse 24 and 25. This is immediately after giving the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses this really extraordinary instruction. Exodus 20, verse 24. He says, an altar of earth 
shall you make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. Why is he talking about this right after he gave the law? Because the point of the law is to show us you need to be, you need a savior, you need a substitute. You, you, knew, you need something that will, that will make you right with me, which, can't, which does not come from you. And so he says, in all of earth you'll make, you make for me and a sacrifice on it, your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you. Not you come to me. I will come to you and I will bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones. You shall not wield your tool on it or you profane it. What is that all about? See, that what this is about is God saying, you know what? I, you know you can't keep those commandments. I know you can't keep those commandments. You, remember, you, may, you may remember the first time Moses had those commandments and he's coming down the mountain, they had already broken every one of them before he ever got to the bottom of the hill. Remember that? It was just, it was just showing human nature at its best or at its worst, whatever. I know you can't keep those commandments. You know, you know you can't keep those commandments. So here's the solution. Offer a sacrifice. Bring a substitute. Bring someone who will carry your sins symbolically. And I will forgive you. That's why the sacrifice comes right after the law. But notice what he says. I don't want any fancy scroll work. I don't want you to... Do anything with those stones. I don't want you to square the stones off. I don't want you to put any fancy scroll work on that. I don't want you to modify it in any way. You modify that altar and you profane it. What's he saying? No human merit. You have nothing you can bring to me. See yourself in light of who I am. And then you will understand salvation is my work. That's why in Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 when Jonah's praying in the belly of the whale he says salvation is of the Lord. Jonah got the point. He couldn't save himself. Salvation is of the Lord. Turn to Joshua. 40 years later after this Exodus one. You're in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua chapter 8. Moses is gone now. The children of Israel are, have gone into the land, begun to conquer the land. And in Joshua chapter 8, verse 30, we read this. Joshua 8, verse 30. It says, at that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. He built it on Mount Ebal. It's a lot of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, you should go back and check it out sometime. There's a lot of theology taught in there. But they built this altar on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. Joshua got it. He got the altar built the way God wanted it to represent the fact that it's all of God and nothing of human effort. Joshua got the point, beloved. Do you get the point? The Pharisees didn't get the point. It was there all the time. No works allowed. Don't come to me with your works. Come to me with your sin. That's all you can bring. You must take the lowest seat at the table. You have to check your pride at the door. You have to check your accomplishments at the door. Only the Holy Spirit, beloved, can, can prompt that in our heart. But if the Holy Spirit prompts that in your heart, that's the time to come to God. When you realize you need to be at the lowest seat at the table. But you can't bring anything of your own. When a, the Holy Spirit will prompt in your heart a desire that you want God so much that you're willing to give up all the rest of it. Paul said that in Philippians 3. He listed... Remember how he listed all the advantages that he had. Paul, Paul could legitimately, truthfully say, I was the best man that I know. I don't know how many of us could say we're that good. I couldn't come close. I'm guessing most of us would probably realize we can't, but Paul could. He could say, I was the best person I know. I had every advantage that I can think of. 
Nobody topped me in any way in keeping the law. I was blameless as far as I understood the law. I was blameless in every way. I, I had, and, and not only was I just neutrally blameless, I was zealous for the law. I loved the law of God. I loved to try and get right with God. I was killing Christians because I thought they were against God. His zeal was so elaborate. But here's what he says. Philippians 3, verse 7, he said, but whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. How do you gain Christ? By counting everything else as worthless, useless, rubbish, worse than useless. To gain Christ, I have to give up me. You see that? Jesus is just saying the same thing over and over and over again. I realize that. I've got to take the lowest seat at the table. It takes a lot of humility to confess my sin, give up my accomplishments, take the back seat, but that's what Jesus says is necessary. That's where he's pointing these Pharisees by the spiritual implications of his parable. Now, there is a secondary application here, I think, which is, which is very clear. Once I've come to Christ by faith, by giving up everything of my performance, what's the logical... And, and, and Jesus gives me forgiveness. He cleanses me of all the sin, every wrong, the little ones, the big ones, all of them, they're all covered. What's the logical extension of that? That having gotten that by giving up everything, having gotten that by humbling myself before God, that I now live that kind of lifestyle, right? That my Christian lifestyle is one of humility, is one of gracefulness, is one of taking the back seat and letting God do the promoting. So that's a secondary application because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So now I'm supposed to live like that as a Christian. Don't put myself forward. Let God do the exalting. Human pride, very ugly characteristic. It's ugly when we see it, but the ugliest thing about it is it keeps most people from Christ. That's the ugliest thing. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great, great 20th century pastor in London, Westminster Chapel, my brother and I visited there when we were over there a few years ago. I hate to say the church is a shell of what it was when he was there, when it would be filled to the rafters every week. Wonderful preacher, but he, he was invited one time to preach at Oxford University. And so he went and he preached the simple gospel message, the same as he would have anywhere else. When he got all done, there was a Q&A period of time. And so a brilliant young law student got up. He was the head of the debating team. And he got up and he, first of all, he complimented Dr. Jones on his presentation. He said, your presentation was wonderful. He said, uh, really enjoyed your delivery and your style. He said, I will, I will say this. He said, the content, I found the content to be very deficient. He said the content was way too simple. He said, why, a simple farm laborer could have understood this. This, is, this was not a presentation that was suitable for an audience at Oxford. And when he got all done, there was jeering laughter because of the things he'd had to say. So the chairman turned to Lloyd-Jones for a response. Now, Lloyd-Jones just happened to be a university-trained medical doctor. He was no dummy. He had actually been on staff at one point. He was very young when he went into the ministry, but he'd been a doctor for a little while, and he was on staff to the guy that was the doctor to the royal family. He was no dummy. But here's what he said. He said, as to your objection to my content, I confess that while I might be a heretic, I had until being enlightened by the gentleman, considered the undergraduates and, and indeed the graduates of Oxford University as being just ordinary common human clay and miserable sinners like everybody else. And thus with needs precisely the same as those of myself, the agricultural laborer, or anyone else. I preached as I did deliberately, hoping that the Oxford crowd would be able to understand as well as the agricultural crowd did. <laughs> That's the right message. 
the lowest seat at the table. We're all in the same boat, beloved. Pharisees, 21st century churchgoers, Oxford, Oxford students, we're all experts at sin. We do it well, we cover it well, we rationalize it well, we're experts. We're experts at sin. We're all in need of a God who will come to us, a God who can never be earned but can be accepted on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus. The Jesus who told this parable was on his way to the cross to pay for the sins of all the people who were sitting there, to pay for the sins of the disciples, to pay for the sins of the Pharisees, to pay for the sins of anyone who had ever come to faith in him. That's the only way. By taking the lowest seat at the table, we can have eternal life. But it's the only way. And then the promotions are up to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder one more time of how, um, how much we need you. Lord, nothing in our daily experience, most of the time, once in a while something comes along, but most of the time nothing in our daily experience convinces us that we're in any great moral need. We're as good as the next guy. We're doing fine. It's only when we see ourselves next to you that we begin to get a glimpse of who we really are. And so, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who hasn't quite caught on to that yet, hasn't understood how deep the hole is that we are in, that you would convince them now. Open their heart, Father, by the ministry of your Holy Spirit and the power of your word to see themselves and then cause them to open their heart to you. Cause them to confess their sin. Cause them to repent of their sin. To take the lowest seat at the table and to come in. I pray for that, Father, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for the Lord who has made salvation possible. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.